Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, we are so excited that you all are joining us today. Um, we're all working from home. Um, my name is Shaz Akram and I'm the Deputy Director at the Fulbright Association. Um, again, like uh, I want to thank you all for joining our career ser series for young professionals, especially created to support the newly returned Fulbright alumni as well as the young professionals in our network. Um, the Fulbright Association, as you know <coughs> this, but for those who do not know this, the Fulbright Association is an independent nonprofit established in 1977, representing 140,000 U.S. alumni. Through our 54 local chapters, the association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year. We advocate for the program and promote international education. That's in a nutshell what, who we are. I would like to introduce our two speakers today, uh, Andrew Evans and Liz Newman. Andrew and Liz. Uh, Andrew is a retired CFO from Wellesley College. He has served in the Foreign Service with USAID overseas and in Washington, DC, and later served as Associate Dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He was, an administra he was on an administrative Fulbright grant to the UK in 1992. Um, welcome, Fulbrighter. Liz Newman has over 30 years of experience in financial management, organizational consulting, and executive search. With an established track record of serving clients in higher education, Liz is a trusted confidant and advisor to university presidents, provosts, and boards. She's also a recently retired managing partner at Koya Leadership Partners. I also want to introduce Lisa Boucher now. Lisa? Hi, everyone. So glad to have you here. My name is Lisa Boche. I'm the program manager at the Fulbright Association here in DC. I was a Fulbrighter to Peru in 2016. I was an ETA. So shout out to all the ETAs. Um, I just want to set a few norms before we get started. So we do ask that everyone keeps your microphone on mute to minimize background noise. We also ask that um, you keep your cameras off. This will just help uh, with the bandwidth and should make sure we have minimal uh, technical difficulties. And then uh, lastly, we just want to ask that if you have any questions that you use the chat function. Um, all Q&A is going to be done through the chat. We are going to first let Liz and Andy give their presentation and then we will answer all of the questions at the end. Um, if we are unable to get to your question, we will be sending out some follow up emails later. So we're always happy to continue conversations with you after this webinar. So thank you so much for joining us with that. I'm going to turn it over to Andy to get us started. Thanks, Lisa, so much. Um, and I want to thank Shaz and the whole Fulbright Association program for including us and offering this opportunity to talk with you today. We're very appreciative of that. Um, I just want to repeat what Lisa just said about questions. If you have questions, please use the chat function, the Zoom chat function, and um, they'll be monitored as we go along. My colleagues will be monitoring those, and we want to make sure that we get to your question. If by some chance we don't, and you, or you think of a question later, after the end of the, of the presentation, um, you will find at the end uh, we will uh, share our um, uh, email accounts, and uh, you're welcome to email us with any question you might have. We'll, we'll follow up later. So um, Liz is going to share the screen here. You can see it's already up here. And um, let's get started. The presentation is being recorded and will be shared at a later time. So you'll, you'll be able to see these slides again. If you have any, uh, want to refer to them later, uh, they will be available. So we, we, uh, we should get started. So this is a four part webinar series. We're going to focus on session one today, which is looking for the right job. But just to give an overview of the whole series, uh, we want, to, want you to know that uh, in the second one, we'll be talking about highlighting your skills and how to prepare or how to refine or how to fine tune your resume. It's really important. Uh, that will be a very important session. Session three is as you get closer to um, selecting a job to apply to, preparing a letter of interest, or some people call it a cover letter, and how you actually apply. So we'll be on, in session three, we'll be talking about those uh, parts of the, of the uh, process of getting a new job. And then session four is uh, if you are invited uh, to be part of the um, 
interviewing process, the, the finalist group that they're talking to, then uh, they will, um, we'll give you, we'll talk a little bit about what, how you can prepare for that. So just to go, if we go to the next slide, um, this is, again is what we're going to talk about today. We'll come back to that in a moment, but we're looking for um, uh, launching this whole search process. Um, in session, thanks Liz, <laughs> in, session, <laughs> in session two, we're going to uh, work on the, a little bit more about the focus on the preparation of the resume. So this is the first homework assignment. If you're going to join us the next, in the next webinar, your first assignment for homework is to prepare your resume for next week. And maybe you already have one, maybe you haven't looked at it in a year, maybe you haven't looked at it at all. Maybe you need to really think about it and start. And so um, that's, that's what we ask you to do is if you come with your resume prepared, then we'll talk through a bit, a bit about what, what uh, constitutes uh, um, the strongest resume. We'll, we'll also uh, describe uh, or ask you to describe or, or get you to really evaluate your resume in terms of have you provided enough detail? Have you provided too little detail? And then um, talk a little bit how the application process differs across uh, different industries and um, get your thoughts on that or get our, give you our thoughts on that in order for able to you to be able to be more, um, more marketable, if you will. And that's what this particular moment in, this, in uh, this particular time, I think is going to be more and more challenging. Um, so moving on then to session three, uh, preparing a letter of interest and application. What's a really good letter of interest convey? How does it differ from a cover letter? Um, again, going back to what's the application process? Many application processes are now online and we wanna talk a little bit about that. And then um, other considerations as you go about the actually applying for the job. Then in session four, we're gonna talk about um, the first interview, if you're invited for an interview and how to prepare for that. If it's a live interview, who you're meeting with, uh, if it's um, in person or not in person or not in person, there are differences there that you need to prepare for. And uh, we'll talk about that and then after the interview is done, what do you do to follow up uh, after the interview et etiquette, we're calling that. And then if you are uh, actually offered the job, how you, need to, how you need to consider that offer and what you need to do to follow up to actually secure the position. So um, looking forward to having you present for all of those four sessions. So here's a moment, if you have questions to put them in the chat box, just as we transfer um, slide deck to the second one where we actually go back now and look on session one. There we go. Oh, Andy, just, I'm just gonna, um, as we start talking about the right job, uh, quickly in the chat room, there's a talk about okay. a job versus the right job. Yes. And I, I just, I think that we have all, as we prepared for this webinar, been completely aware that this is an opportunity for a job and being flexible and creative. So we are focused on that, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe during this home confinement uh, here or wherever you are, um, perhaps you've been able to give more thought to um, whether you're gonna look for a job right now or pursue additional education or um, just find the right opportunity as you go forward. And in, in light, again, in light of what's going on now in the economy, I think you just have to know that whatever path you are considering, you'll need to be flexible and creative. And um, I think that's the best advice we can offer you at the moment is don't rule anything out until you're sure and then um, go with whatever you can get. Um, I think if you've been thinking about uh, long-term career goals, that's great. So taking the big picture now, um, so example, for example, what do, what do you, in your job, what would you prefer? Desire to serve others? Looking for a for-profit or a non-profit environment? Maybe one that's more science-focused or government-based? And what we would encourage you to do is to engage in some self-assessment of your core competencies. So you have a writing strength, make sure you Identify, self-identify that. Data analytics. You're very comfortable with oral presentation. Um, 
you communicate. You've always been told you communicate well. You have communication ability. Um, you have a willingness to take on seemingly unsolvable problems. Uh, you have strong IT experience. Um, and whether you prefer working towards annual production goals, um, or maybe you're excited by sales in that context, um, and also whether you most prefer working in a team or even leading a team or not. And all of those are going to help you in this sort of self-assessment define and fine tune where, where and how to look for the next job opportunity. So some practical considerations, of course, are, well, what are your salary needs at the moment? Uh, are you really needing to stay in the current location or do you have preferences of where you would move? Um, are there other family and environmental issues that would impact job choices? and other kinds of, of uh, factors in your job search. I don't know whether Liz, you wanted to add anything right I there. I, yeah. I think this is the, the reality check piece of all of this. So are you mobile? Do you just need a job to get income now? And how do you go about doing that? And I just wanna say, don't, in, I say, don't worry about, if you really need a job, go find a job. It can be at a Whole Foods or delivering or something like that if you really need it. It's not a bad thing to think about now if you really need money coming in. It's also a time to think about um, going back to school if you can afford to do that um, online or, or a full PhD or a master's program, if that's what you're able to do. I talked to a colleague of mine this week who had left her job and was looking for a job while starting her PhD part-time and now she's decided to go full freight with her PhD because she's able to do that now knowing that a year from now she'll be AVD and she can be looking for a job and finishing her dissertation so I think I would be um, Andy said this earlier adaptable flexible but also realistic can can you move can you not move can, you know should you be volunteering for a company um, I think it's sort of I mean, none of us have been through this, even those of us as old as I am, I have never been through anything like this. And so being creative and, um, but also being really realistic about where am I at now and what does that, as much as, you know, wh where do I wanna be and what are my aspirations? What's the reality of where I am today? Yeah. I think also um, giving some thought to the type of mission. So. What would get you out of bed in the morning excited to go to work? And, and is that relates to what the mission of the organization is actually about? Um, think about that. I think that's really important in terms of, of finding the right, right position. And then maybe there's an organization out there that you've known about or known a little bit about or heard about that has always sort of intrigued you. So this is the perfect time to start your research. Um, go online. Uh, look at advertisements. There are lots of, um, of places where now, now organizations are putting online uh, all of the position descriptions. So read the position descriptions carefully, very carefully, and see what, their, what the responsibilities are that, that this position will have. It's really important. And um, not, not quite to that slide yet, Liz, but <laughs> hold on. You were, okay. That's okay. Um, Look at, uh, in looking at the uh, advertisements, you might wonder, well, where can I go? If you go online and look, just put in uh, uh, jobs, you'll find pages of uh, new online websites that will allow you to actually dig into what a job is actually looking for. So uh, I encourage you that there, to, 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 to read as much as you possibly can to get an understanding of, of uh, what's out there. So, and then what also you can do, next slide, here we are now, um, is on the next slide to um, talk about um, what skills are they looking for and what skills do you have? So start by making a list of all the things that you have accomplished that set you apart and ask yourself maybe the following questions. What did I do that was above and beyond my normal job duties or educational assignments? How did I stand out among other employees or students? Or how did I make a difference to the, to the students in my class or the employees in my division or department um, or on my team? 
Was I ever recognized by the supervisor for a job well done? And when was that and why? Write all this down um, as you go along and think about these things. Did I win any awards or accolades? If you were a teacher, uh, what feedback did you get from your students, from your peers, other teachers, uh, or maybe even school administrators? What new processes did you implement to improve things? So you had an idea, you put it forward, it was accepted, and it made a difference. What problems did you solve? Write all that down. Um, did I ever consistently meet or exceed the goals or quotas of the department or the area that you're working in? And did, um, this is an important one at the moment, and even though it sounds more businessy, it's important to be able to identify if you save the department, the school, the organization, the company money. Uh, this will be important because um, they will want to know if you can deliver the same quality work at less cost. Uh, in this particular environment, I would say over the next three to five years, people are going to be very interested in those kinds of skills. And then maybe what, what made you really great at your job? Uh, I think that's also very important. And um, this is all to get a sense of um, what sets you apart and what, what are your strengths. Many times it's not the progression of jobs that you have had in the past that's going to get you the job necessarily. It's what skills you have. Liz, maybe you might comment on that as well. Yeah, I, I, as I'm listening to you, Andy, it's funny. I think about um, identifying the skills, but also thinking about how you will translate those skills to a particular job or position description. So one of the things, um, I don't know what the data is anymore, but there is data that says that um, women tend to think they need to have done everything before they can apply for a job and they point out the things they haven't done. Um, and so I think it's important to identify these skills, but I also think it's important if it's a job opportunity that appeals to you, um, why does it appeal to you and what think creatively about how to present those skills in a way so you're not just checking them off and saying, yes, 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 I've done them, but what would I do in this position based on what I've done in the past as well? Yeah. I think um, on a personal uh, point, both Liz and I have had experience where people made a shift out of the federal government and into a position in higher ed. So the higher ed people were saying, well, bring us someone who has lots of experience in higher ed. And yet when we unpack that, what they were looking for was a specific skill set. And these people had those same kinds of skills in their job in the government. So we had to force the people to, talk, to look really more on the skills. That was part of our job. And um, they were very successful in the end. So we felt pretty good about that. It's also really helpful um, to bring a different perspective. Um, so not having spent your entire career in one place, but being in different industries or types of organizations, you bring something new and different to the perspective, which I think people do look for. Yep. And then in some cases, you'll come to realize that a new job, if, it, if you see a job that you really are interested, but it's not everything, then there's some pieces of it that are not as attractive to you, but it provides um, growth. It, it will give you professional growth. If you take that job, you will know that, the, that that period of time will be well spent in terms of expanding your skills. And that can be really important in terms of your overall career. Okay, so uh, next slide is talking a little bit more about um, is the level of the position a match? Uh, is the salary that they're offering uh, the right salary for you? And in this challenging time, again, being realistic and flexible is really important. So do the skills that they're looking for reflect many or most of the accomplishments that we just talked about on the self-assessment you just did on the previous page? So do you, if going into that, do you have many or a good number of the skills that they're looking for? That, that, there's no reason to apply for a job for which you have no skills relevant, uh, but there's every reason to believe that even though you don't have every single one, you have a good, good uh, amount of skills that would be able to uh, put you in a good position to be able to be successful in that job. So again, fine tune the search to find the positions that match your skills. And then um, the next really important piece is to learn about the steps of this search. And Liz, maybe you might talk a little bit about that. 
So it, um, every organization does look for jobs and recruit people in different ways. And since Andy and I did a lot of recruiting and executive search, I think we have a pretty good perspective on this that you may find helpful. But so I, I also just want to say, I know that you're, I think there are a number of things that will be going on in your life. You may be getting any job, you may be doing volunteering. And at the same time, this, this set of uh, initiatives that we're talking about and finding a job, it's, it may be a little more long term, but I think it's a great thing to focus on at what, as the reality of your life unfolds, basically. So you're keeping the focus on the future a little bit. So um, when you find a job and you want to apply for it, um, the, it's important to get a sense, if possible, of who is performing the search. Is it the manager of the job? Is there an HR professional involved? Um, who should be your contact? Uh, and that, um, sometimes there's an outside search firm. So knowing that helps you think about um, how to get your information and who to reach out to rather than just sort of, you know, throwing to the wind, caution to the wind, so to speak. You will be one of many people applying for a job. And so how you strategically think about your outreach, not just your paper product, but who you reach out to to talk to about the job can also be very helpful. So see what you can find out. Um, maybe you know somebody at the company, maybe they say in the application or the position description who is responsible. Um, try and be in touch with that person. It's really helpful, not to the point of obsessing about it, but checking in. Um, you are your own advocate in a lot of these situations. And so reaching out to people and asking questions says something about you, I think, even as an application, as an applicant. Um, you can learn the time frame. hopefully. I mean, we've heard from some people that there are a lot of jobs out there that maybe have been filled or on hold. So do your homework as you're looking at what is online. Um, is it a real job? Is it a job for now? Is it a job you know, for three months from now, find out as much as you can. There's usually someone to contact. Um, and I guess I would also say you might expect in this time frame that um, it, people are going to take longer to get back to you, I would say, because I think a lot of companies are still trying to figure out how to be in this new world as well. So have some patience, but, you know, be on top of it as much as you can. Um, and the, it goes on, you know, what uh, will the interviews be by Zoom, um, Skype, FaceTime, um, phone, what will the process be like? There's nothing wrong with asking about the process so you can prepare yourself as best you can for whatever it is. Um, you know, what do they want for references? Um, will they do background checks? Um, what will the offer letter look like? All of those types of things. So get a sense of the entire process as you're moving along. I, I just can't even stress enough that your level of interest in this also says something about you as a candidate, I think. I don't, Andy, do you wanna to add to that? No, I think that's completely right. And I think that um, the more you know about a particular institution, the more you can ask questions that are important and people will read that as your real interest in, uh, in what they do. Uh, and people want to have people join them uh, who are as interested as they are in doing that kind of work. I think I also want to just pause here a second and say again is that um, if you are a recently returned Fulbright person and as an ETA, or if you are someone who has um, trying to decide the making a choice between graduate school or getting a job right now, um, it's all it's probably not going to be a, a, a sequential process. It's probably going to be a constant uh, conversation of all different kinds of options. What you really want in the end is to be able to have lots of options to choose from. And uh, you know, whether that's gonna happen right now, I can't tell you that, but uh, it's better to have more options than just sort of be uh, going yeah. down one particular route and, and, and counting on one particular company and then that company changes their direction or something like that. So, so. interesting, I, I spent so much time talking about how we can't multitask. And it seems to me at this moment, you throw a lot at the wall and see what sticks right now. It's, yeah. it, I think, so, I mean, it, I think about my scattered mind in a day and how I do many, many different things. I think in some ways it's the same thing. Go, follow a number of different things and see what ends up coming yeah. to the top. And I would say in terms of, um, in particular, there's something you all share, which is the Fulbright experience. 
be very, um, very conscious of what that experience has meant to you and be able to articulate that in a very clear way. I think that, uh, and then see how it's relevant, try and make it relevant to this particular experience. I left my home and I went to Malaysia and I uh, had to find my own housing or housing was provided to me or I had to develop a relationship with a whole new group of people and I'd never been there before. All of those things sort of indicate your ability to take on new situations. So develop a really good story around that experience or other experience, but in particular and, this one. And the honor of being awarded a Fulbright, right? Absolutely, right. All right, so that moves us on to the networking and informational interviews and really how to develop uh, and maintain relationships with people who can connect you to the next opportunity. So let's talk a little bit about networking. And there are lots of ideas and we've only sort of started on this topic, but um, maybe um, the career center of your undergraduate institution has a very active uh, role in accessing alumni and you know maybe that's possible that you can go back to them uh, think about other connections that you've had through that experience um, be curious in your outreach in terms of going with to others uh, maybe there um, are connections that are outside of your uh, regular work that's maybe it's a sports team maybe that you participate in maybe it's a group of uh, former uh, colleagues that get together, be creative about how you and be curious in that outreach. And if you ask, if you have the opportunity to ask for an informational interview, um, have do your research and have specific types of questions for that industry and work. Uh, and of course, I'm saying this, never say I just need a job uh, because that is not going to be well received by the employer. Um, may sound obvious to you, but I have to tell you, it's really important to be specific about the types of questions related to that particular industry. Um, Liz, you wanna talk about the information interviews a little bit? Yes, um, so I, I, I can't stress enough, one, as Andy has said, the networking, I think everything and every place is a network now, your family, your friends, the people you're on this webinar with potentially. Um, but for informational interviews, um, what I've learned, I, I've been on both sides of this. So um, people are really happy to give you advice or talk to you. And so I would say um, it's probably a 15 minute interaction. Now it's probably a Zoom or a phone call. Uh, it's probably not in person. So maybe it's virtual coffee. Um, it's you introduce yourself in a way that either makes the connection or expresses the interest very quickly. I'm um, see this a lot on LinkedIn. I've done a lot of interactions, even, even as a retired person in the last year, my LinkedIn connections still reach out to me. Um, it's quick. Hi, Liz. This is what I want to talk to you about. Um, and when someone accepts, um, be prompt, be there and have, I would say, three or four questions. That would be my, and it's not about, can you get me a job? It's about, um, tell me what's going on in your industry. What has this been like for you to transition this? Do you have any advice for me? Something like that. So I, what, I mean, I'll, I'll, I built my business by calling people and asking them questions, not for work, but what's going on in higher ed in this arena and this stuff. I learned so much. And it, it also gives you maybe who your next networking person is. Maybe the hope would be, I think, that they might connect you with one or two other people somehow in that conversation. Or you might even come back to them and say, thanks so much for your advice. I was thinking this might be a good person for me to talk to. Could you introduce me? It's short, it's sweet, it's thorough, and it's not get me a job. But that's, uh, Andy, I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I, I think that I would just uh, encourage people to be as broad in their look as possible. Yep. And even though you go and talk to someone because that person was welcoming, and it may not be the right industry, that person may have a connection that would benefit you uh, down the road. And maybe that person's spouse works in the particular industry, you never know. Uh, at this moment, it's time consuming, but it's just what you're gonna have to do. Right, and I, if you think there's follow-up, I would identify it and ask, can I, can I reach back out to you in another month or something like that? So, I mean, I, know the, I think, one of the really hard parts of this right now is balancing being appropriately inquisitive and thorough and being um, 
in someone's face too much. So um, I think everybody is stressed. I think lots of people are going to be making these calls. So the more intentional and clear you are about what your what your intention of the call is, uh, and the more quickly you can identify what the follow-up might be so you're not asking that person for the follow-up you're saying what if i called back in a month here's or in another in a note a follow-up email or linkedin or text if you're using it thank you for this here's what i'm going to do for the next follow-up would it be okay if i called you in another month something like that so they see your initiative um you'll know if people are getting frustrated i think but the goal really is it it builds your network um, I'm on a lot of groups on LinkedIn. We talk about this at a later time, but there are lots of ways to build a network and informational interviews is one. And I mean, I think if you go on the internet now, everybody talks about your networks and relationships being where you're going to find a job more than ever. And this is part of doing that. Yeah. So let's shift to another question we often hear. Uh, and that is what about an internship? So you, there are paid internships and then there are unpaid internships. So if the, ideally, obviously it's paid, but if there's a perfect internship, but it's unpaid, uh, can you piece together other sources of income? Can you get a, an evening job or a morning job or whatever uh, and get enough money to pay the bills so that you can actually take this unpaid internship in the particular organization or industry that is really your ideal? Um, and then also volunteering uh, is another possibility for a particular um, organization that then gets you access to people who are part of that organization and uh, can really, you can really see if this is the career aspiration that, that uh, you need to work on further. So those are, I would say all those are also um, options that you need to be open to. Uh, we talked about traditional networks and online networking. Um, just to repeat again, networking is critical. Um, want to talk a little bit about the social media audit. And Liz and I have had a lot of experience with this. Um, so take a step back and go online, Google yourself, uh, and see with a new lens what people can find out about you online. And um, what's on your LinkedIn account, what's on Twitter, what's on Instagram, what's on Facebook, your Facebook page, if you have that or any other social media platforms. And um, are there articles about you in the press or references to you in the press? Um, is there, a, God forbid, a, a, a history, a legal history, a DUI history of some sort, or whatever you can see, assume that a potential employer can see. So clean that up work on cleaning that up. And uh, just remember that your favorite college party picture won't maybe get the same laugh that the, uh, for you as the, uh, for the potential employer. So that's just a caution. Liz, do you want to comment on that a little bit more? Yeah, I will say, so what we came to do in our business, and I know that even though we did it, our clients did it as well, is people did social media checks. So um, people look at your LinkedIn page, they match it to your resume. So make sure that the degrees are the same, that the titles are the same, that the, the sequence of your events is the same. Um, it's just so important. Um, and Facebook and Instagram, I mean, we have had instances where Search committees have been very hesitant to move forward with a candidate because of what they saw on an Instagram or a Facebook posting or something like that. And that, so here again is this word balance. You want to be true to who you are and that we're not suggesting that you not be that, but just be aware if someone does a social media check on you, what they will see and be prepared to discuss it. Yeah. And I think Andy's right. Um, the college pictures may not be exactly, I mean, it, it's, you know, maybe it's a great picture. I don't know, but <laughs> just be very, very intentional with that, that some, you might even ask a colleague or a friend or somebody to look at all of it and give you feedback that's objective. Yeah. All right. So that's, that's where we are at the end of the presentation here. I really would like to uh, get to some of your questions. So, I have. Go ahead, One I want yeah. us to talk about, okay? And I think you and I can both address this. Um, 
how do you convince employers or hiring committees that experiences transfer to skills? Yeah. Um, and it's a really, really good question. And um, we alluded to it early on about not feeling you have to do a checklist of, yes, I've done this, yes, I've done that. Um, it can be in how you word the experience within your resume. It, in, so a resume to me, and we're gonna talk about this more later, has is almost a cut and paste thing depending upon the position you're applying for. It's not the same for every position. It also can be in a letter of interest, just, just assuming that you have that skill and giving an example as a teacher of how what you did as a teacher is relevant to the skill set they're looking for. So it's like making sure your chronology on your resume is clear identifying the skill sets that are appropriate. And I sort of see it as your responsibility to convince them that it is the skill that they're looking for somehow and how you present it. Andy, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah, I would just say that again, um, think back about the particular skills that you have. If it says that you, you know, have to manage a budget and you sort of reflect on yourself, well, the only thing I ever did was X, Y, Z. What was it that you did? And talk about that in a positive way. Is that, you know, it wasn't $10 million, but it was a $500,000 student activities budget that I was responsible for as the treasurer of that organization. And uh, we had to go through certain processes and so on. So think carefully about things that you have done that relate and then develop the, the, the accurate story of, of how that is relevant to the skills they're looking for. The reality right now is if you are transitioning into another field, HR people often are looking for that direct check because right. they're looking at a lot of applications. So it's really helpful for you to describe how what your skill set is or your experience is as appropriate skill set. And again, it's a great opportunity to show how you write, how you communicate. Um, I think it's just an added plus. Yep. Uh, other questions? Somebody asked about, they had applied to several NGO jobs, there was no contact, um, and they haven't heard back, like the World Bank and the Obama Foundation. There's nobody to reach out to. Um, what do you do? At, at this time. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's it's tricky. A good question. Yeah, it's a really good question. I think um, if you can somehow find the connection maybe through LinkedIn. So if the CEO or the HR person that you're able to find is uh, on LinkedIn, whether you can send that person a message through LinkedIn, those, those are active in these times. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's possible, maybe it's not possible, but just sort of be creative of how you might be able to reach out to one of those people. I mean, we are seeing through our colleagues who do search, a lot of positions are being put on hold right now. Right. So I think a lot of institutions are still trying to strategically figure out how to move forward and the positions that are going forward are often the critical ones, however they define that. And so it may require a little bit of patience, I would say. Right, right. Um, Andy, there, I just saw another one that was really interesting. Um, oh, should you, should your Facebook be public? Like if you're, if, it's a really good point. If you're applying to an NGO where your values or your political party or something makes a difference, um, should it, and your Facebook reflects that. I, I, here again is where I say you just need to do an audit of what's there and how you're consistent with it. And if it's important to you and that's what you want in your career and job, I think it's okay to have it be public. I, I don't know how you feel about that, Andy. I, it's, so I have a little different opinion is yeah. that um, I had a recent uh, year or so ago search where the person's um, Facebook page was filled with all of his outside interests. And the problem was some of those outside interests were um, probably not going to be widely shared among the group, uh, among the search committee. And so the net result was that uh, I had to tell this person, I said, I, I, I understand that you have these strong interests, I said, but you will probably end up in an interview situation only talking about those things. And you don't want the conversation to be focused on those things. You want them to be focused on your skills uh, and what you've done in your job, not in your extracurricular activities. And uh, we had a serious conversation about it. And in the end, he took them down. 
And uh, he, he didn't get the job, but he, he certainly moved to the next step, which I think would not have happened if he, it would only been talking about these extracurricular activities that he had. There's a question. I think you, we talked about this with Shaz and Lisa about the non-competitive eligibility. I don't know if Lisa or Shaz wants to talk about that. I know we did talk about, we, you mentioned that yesterday, I think. I'm so sorry. we have um, yeah. we have it on the we have a um, resource page we've set up for um, newly uh, returned uh, alumni and the whole um, steps for it are listed at the bottom of it. Um, I have shared that link uh, on the chat with everyone. Um, I think I can. Great. So so it's it's. That means that as, as a grantee of any Fulbright exchange, uh, sorry, any uh, State Department exchange program, you will not have to go through the extra clearance. Oh, that's right, you yes. Automatically be in line to be selected for a job in the federal government. Okay. Great. Andy, there's a quite, there are a couple of questions. One is about um, how to put side gigs on social media or resumes if you're doing that while you're looking for your long-term career? My own, my own feeling is I think people are very interested in your side gigs. Um, they may ask you uh, how much time is the side gig going to, if you were to take this job and, and be offered this job, uh, is that side gig going to continue at the same level? Um, and uh, I think you have to have an answer for that. But I think in general, people are very interested in how you occupy your time outside of work. And if you're doing yoga on Zoom, I would love to see it because I do a lot of yoga on Zoom these days. So that was one of the, so. If you play, um, in, a, if you play in a group band or something like that. Yeah, people, it's great. Isn't that, they like that. It's great. So the next one is about um, applicant tracking systems. And we have really been talking about this because um, the question is, will my resume be, is, is there a guarantee my resume will be seen by an HR person? if at an entry level I go through an applicant tracking system. And I don't know the exact answer to that. What I do know um, is it's good to be in that system. And Andy and I know a few people who actually outside of institutions have those kind of databases. And we're trying to learn more about how people would now get into those databases. The reality is, it's if I understand it, it kicks out it, like you that's why you're asking this question. It matches you to the skill set and kicks you out on a probably a prioritized list based on that. So I guess the way to answer the question is if you can format your resume in such a way that you hit all the skill sets somehow in a pretty easy way to, for a tracking system to identify, then you might be on the top of the pile. Right. I don't know, Andy, if you want to add to that. No, I agree with that. I think, again, this is going back and reading very carefully what is in the, uh, the job description, the position description. And if they're asking about particular uh, response, or they're naming different responsibilities that, that are um, in this job description, make sure that, that their language that you're using somehow it can be tracked in your application so that that doesn't get thrown out because you may be doing the exact same thing, but calling it something else. So be very careful about that. Right. Look be at the wording. Policy, yeah. Look at the wording. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what sorts of volunteer activities can we do virtually that build skills that are most applicable to NGO setting? It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you the things that have appealed to me, and I'm not looking for a job. So um, there are a lot of organizations now that are doing um, either get out the vote or... Um, postcards virtually now for candidates. And I don't know if it would get you to an NGO setting, but it could be a really interesting network to build, to get to know these people is one thing I think about. Um, the Red Cross is actually doing a contest between now and the end of May, um, asking people who are on their list or registered to take as many of their training programs as possible online. It's a really smart idea, actually. They're getting people trained up for maybe doing food banks or blood donors or emergency um, services that they offer, getting them prepared. 
um, so for when they can go live. But at the same time, doing something like that gets you in that network on the Red Cross. And I would imagine if, if you took a lot of those courses, they would see that as being valuable. So I, those are two I can think of. Yeah, this is a little, uh, little bit of a departure from that, but it was triggered by the idea of taking courses. So there are some opportunities to take specific courses. Let's say you have not had budget responsibilities, but budgeting in a nonprofit environment is a course you've seen advertised somewhere uh, that might be of use uh, in, in actually enhancing your resume. That's something you might do as well. So um, I, that's not a volunteer thing, but that's sort of like a professional development kind of thing that would enhance your resume. So um, this is an interesting question, Andy. I, um, so given that some Fulbright programs um, were evacuated in only one to three months after the grant had started, how do I frame that on a sh as a short-term experience to future employees? I think you're straightforward about it, that it was obviously uh, a worldwide pandemic that you returned to the United States, but during that three months abroad, this is what I accomplished. And, and be very, very direct about that and how excited you were for that period of time and how you hope to be able to leverage that experience even though it wasn't a year or whatever it was going to be, uh, it was still very formative for you. So I, don't, I wouldn't focus so much that, I was, that you were taken out of country and had to come back, but more about that I ended up really missing that I couldn't stay because I accomplished these particular skills. And by the way, you have a pretty good reason for being taken out. Yeah. So, right. I mean, that, that's <laughs> right. Um, so, approaching Fulbright alumni who have connections to organizations, I, we have been talking with Shaz and Lisa about this. Um, I, my gut is these calls may connect you. I mean, I've actually thought maybe you come up with a buddy system somehow. There are also chapters. So, um, Shaz and Lisa, I, I mean, I know there are ways to connect. I'm, those are two that I've thought of. I don't know if either of you want to comment on that. I think Lisa, you want to talk about the chapter network? Sure, yeah. So we have 54 chapters across the US. The easiest way to find them is to go to our website and then click under chapters and you can look and see if you have one in your area. And the best thing to do is just reach out to someone in those chapters, maybe um, they have a Facebook page or you can use their website to see who the president is and find their email address, which is on our website and just reach out to them. Um, I think that our, especially within this Fulbright network and our chapter leaders are always so welcoming and eager to talk to Fulbrighters and find something in common and talk about your experiences. And I found that in the Fulbright network, people are always willing to share and talk with you about your experiences. And it's just a really great network to take advantage of. So. I would definitely encourage using the chapter network and just send the email. Um, we also do have the Fulbrighter app. Um, so you can go on the Fulbrighter app, you can make a profile and then you'll actually see a map of the world and you can just kind of click around in cities, you can search by content area and then you can do those cold, um, cold emails or cold messages and just talk about what you have in common and, and you're all Fulbrighter. So you at least can start there and yeah. uh, where you go. Great. So there is, um, uh, somebody just pointed this out, there are a number of people who are asking about how to reach out to people that you don't know. Um, so cold calling, so to speak, um, a, a pro fellowship you're interested in or something like that. And I think that's the, um, I guess I would apply even, I would apply what we talked about earlier, be clear about what your interest is and why. Um, and um, not too persistent in how you reach out, but maybe a compelling enough email or message on LinkedIn or something like that, or even a phone call um, explaining why you're interested. Uh, Andy, do you wanna add, or maybe check in your network to see if anybody knows somebody at the place you're applying. I also think it's, it's um, okay to look for someone in the organization that's in the particular area or working in the particular area. You don't have to write to the, the top person. You could find someone else who, uh, and in this particular time, um, who might be more responsive. And uh, so I would say, if you have a particular interest in, in uh, this NGO and they are working in South Asia or whatever, and there's a South Asia department or division 
uh, right to that person as opposed to the top person. And maybe that might be a way to, to get into an informational interview. It doesn't have to be the, the top person uh, in the whole organization um, that you can get an in, I think. So here's another really good one, using a headhunter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not sure of the context. I mean, I know some people go to headhunters and pay them as a candidate. The way I know headhunters is having been called one for a lot of years. Um, we were retained search headhunters, so our clients paid us to build a pool and help them hire someone. Um, I will say this. I really believe that connections with headhunters can be very, very valuable. Um, there are a lot of good firms that focus on not-for-profits and NGOs, higher education. There are those that focus on IT and for-profits. Um, and um, every good search consultant um, needs to have talented candidates. And, and um, I, I can't decide if now is a good time to connect. I mean, some of these people are working really hard to get more business or finish the searches they're doing. So they're just as busy as everyone else. But it can be really helpful and a good, a really good headhunter helps you with your resume and tells you what is going on in a search or what's going on in an industry. So yes, I think it can be a really great idea. You, you know, all things being equal, some are better to work with than others, but I think it's a great place to have contacts. And I know, I'm sure Andy, you wanna. I, yeah, I, I interpreted the question initially that uh, whether it makes sense to pay someone to uh, place you. And I'd be very cautious about that. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of that. And I'm not as sure it's, it's as popular as it used to be, but it's a, it's a, it may not get you the kind of job that you want. It'll just get the, you placed. And that I think you had to think about seriously. Um, I did notice here, there was a question about, because I was talking about taking some courses and there are some yeah, free so courses. That was the next one. Whether you Andy, should take, Andy yeah. can I just add to the headhunter uh, yeah. issue that um, there are so many headhunters that come after you. You just need to be in certain uh, platforms where you are noticed, especially LinkedIn. Um, it's something that just lands in your lap for free. You do not need to pay headhunters. The companies that want them to find the employee usually end up paying. So if you can find those free resources, there are lots of them on LinkedIn. I Great idea. advise you all to look yep. at that and make sure your profiles are updated on that platform. I, yeah. I have to say, um, I mean, LinkedIn didn't exist when I started this business. Right. And um, it is a fabulous database. You need to keep your information current. Um, there are lots of groups. There are lots of jobs posted. It is really a pretty interesting place to network. I know that in the search business, we do find a lot of candidates there. But I also just know it's a great network, I think, if you're in the right groups. And I, somebody just offered, I mean, they're already starting to get people offering to support, like, I'm in higher ed, so if you have any questions, ask me. I, I, this group could be a really great group. You, it just seems to me the energy that will come out of you all interacting could be really fabulous. Yeah. You were going to talk about certificates. Paying. Yeah, I was going to talk about whether you should pay for the certificates. Um, I guess my inclination is to say no. I mean, you can certainly describe that you were a participant in the program. Maybe the program doesn't allow that. I don't know, but um, it would. You can't. It can't be denied that you spent X number of hours in courses uh, that taught you these particular kinds of skills. And there's nothing wrong with naming those. So you could include those in your resume. I, I think. I've seen them, and I think I. You know, I'm impressed by them actually because it, it always shows to me that the person is interested in getting more skilled and being able to accomplish the changing responsibilities in that particular job. So, so I'm gonna to add to this because I thought it was a really interesting question. I would be leaning towards certificate programs that you might pay a little more for that might hmm. be better programs. Yeah. I, I guess, I mean, I, I mean, you can learn a lot for free and I, I'm looking for them all the time right now. But I think if you're looking for specific certifications, you might think about not just paying for the certification, but what's the program that might be 80 bucks instead of 40 that might be a better program. I don't know, because it's also about learning something as well. So right. I don't know if that. Yeah. Um, other maybe, things. Maybe one more. I noticed we're coming to the end of our time here. 
the, the you guys are getting so much great information on this. Yeah. Coursera and Udacity offer paid certificates. I think aren't they? They you can take the courses for free, but if yeah, I don't okay. know, and you may know more about that, Andy, from your work yeah. Wellesley. Wellesley was a uh, initial member of Coursera, and it was it was never thought to be uh, a money maker, um, uh, but really about a, a transfer of knowledge. And um, there are great opportunities. I think the quality uh, in some of those courses is fabulous. So listing those, I think, is not a bad thing at all. Uh, but I don't know that I would necessarily pay the $40 to get it certified, to get a document that says it's certified. So you've been talking about chapters to join right on the chat, I think. So I don't think we need to address that. Right. Do any of you see a question we might not have gotten to, or is there any like nagging something we left out? Andy, I can't think of anything right now. These are great questions. Really great questions. And again, um, if someone has a thought, you know, uh, tonight or tomorrow morning or whatever, um, please do not hesitate. You can see uh, um, our uh, information is available. And so I'm, I'm very happy and pleased to have had so many of you on the call today. We look forward to talking uh, with you um, next week. And uh, remember your homework of uh, getting out that resume and dusting it off and uh, having a real look at it uh, in terms of some of the things that we talked about today. Andy's so, a really tough grader on resumes, so just be <laughs> careful. All right, I anyway. just put up on the share screen our names and email addresses. Yeah, so feel free to email us, that would be fine. Well, thank you all very much, Shaz. Anything else? Um, I think that uh, you have covered everything. This uh, session is going to be recorded. Um, we will make it available as soon as we can. Uh, with all the questions, feel free to email Andy and Liz. And uh, uh, please note, we're going to have uh, another session next week, same time on Thursday. Uh, next week. Um, we look forward to welcoming some of you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye all. Thank you.